ARCHIX is a collaboration project uh, involving six universities, four research institutes and eight oil companies in Norway. And our aim and goal is to understand the petroleum resources of the Arctic, uh, how to develop the best possible technology that suits the Arctic, which has the least possible environmental impact. The research is mainly uh, divided into three. So three intertwined projects. One is to understand the Arctic geology. We're dealing with uh, petroleum geology and exploration of the Barents Shelf. So of course, geology is a very crucial and important component. I've been working with several different projects and different aspects of, uh, of sedimentation in, in uh, Svalbard and the Barents Sea. But particularly, I've been focusing on the paleogene succession that were deposited 60 million years ago in uh, what they call the central basin of uh, Spitsbergen. So I think this basin is a good analog to some of the basins that you find uh, along the western Barnes Shelf margin. Here you can see there's a layer in the rocks that is a bit darker here. And across the fault you see that this block here has gone down on the other side of the fault. Here you have a layer of sediments here that is thicker where the fault has moved down. So you had some space to deposit more sediments. Of course when it comes to exploration, uh, Having Svalbard as an uplifted part of the subsurface is very important because then we can use this as an analog to the stratigraphy that the companies are working with in the, in the southern part of the Barents Sea. The other one is to understand the environmental impact of our activities. We operate with ecosystem-based management in this region of the world and that means it's a balance of protecting the environment but also utilizing the resources that exist there and that is a big challenge because you have to bring all the stakeholders to the table you have to communicate the risks and you have to come up with solutions and manage the future development activities the final component is a focus on marine mammals because marine mammals are you know, at the top of the food web in the Arctic. They're very much associated with sea ice, so we spend a lot, we have a very strong focus on marine mammals uh, in the program. Marine ecology is an important part of uh, ArcX because um, we want to work sustainable and uh, we need to understand the ecosystem. In case something happens, then we need to understand which um, consequences it can have for the ecosystem. And the third is to develop the best possible eco-friendly technology that is suitable in these vulnerable areas. We are taking part in other projects that use new technology to collect data and analyze data. So of course that's the link between kind of old school conventional geology being out in the field is easily combined with uh, new technology. We also uh, do some technology projects where we develop uh, drone technology for use in these areas uh, and that requires special uh, infrastructure. I use drones or unmanned aerial vehicles to look at um, marine mammals, uh, more specifically whales. They fly in uh, using waypoints, uh, following a set path that we design in a computer with the help of Norut. And then every three or four seconds, they take a picture. And then I look to see if there is a whale there or not, and look at the quality of that picture to see how certain I am and what are the light conditions. It's essentially is to test how, how good these tools are because uh, the use of these systems is, is quite recent and it's been developing really fast. So um, having this for marine mammals, it removes almost completely having the observation that you collect at sea and then goes away that nobody else can look at that. So you, then you have a recording that several people can, can see and uh, you can remove what so-called is uh, the observer bias. The biggest resource we have in a program like this is the group of young people. We have a number of PhD students and postdocs based at universities, but they are also coupled to institutes. What I'll be doing is that I'll, I will investigate the source rock uh, properties of uh, 
specific period, the Triassic period. And also next year we plan to go to Svalbard uh, and collect samples there as well. So we'll also be collecting samples in Bjørnøya. And we will correlate that with wells which have been, which have been drilled in the Barents Sea. And we can see how these properties of the source rock uh, changes laterally. And then we can try to determine how the um, quality of the source rock is in terms of uh, hydrocarbon potential. We conduct many um, field expeditions and, and research uh, expeditions uh, and we, uh, it could be close by or it could be uh, trips that require the use of ships and the University of Tromsø has a research vessel that we use for that. And then we have access to very good laboratories at several of the participating universities, but also industry partners help us with their laboratories. So all in all, it's a, it's a complicated mix of different infrastructure that helps us to conduct the research and give the best possible results back to the participants. I don't know any other project which brings all of these activities in together into one project like this. Uh, and also the sheer volume and size of this project is such that we will have an impact. It's an eight-year uh, project in involving many partners. The cooperation between the academia, uh, the government and the companies as, uh, as cooperators is, is very unique in a, a region uh, setting at least. Uh, and the, the size of the project and the diversity is also very unique. It's a continuous process of improving the way we do things as new knowledge comes to the table. By getting the communication going, we can actually be, also get good information back from authorities that we can use to improve our research uh, programs. The ultimate delivery, I think, uh, is that we would have been very useful for uh, uh, the authorities, uh, for the oil companies, and for the research institutions and universities who are involved in the project. Uh, we will have educated about 30 PhD students and trained postdocs, uh, and we will have published uh, a set of good papers in the best journals. Kuwait Institute for Scientific Research established this research center, which is the Petroleum Research Center, with the aim to make it a regionally recognized center of excellence uh, in both upstream and downstream technologies. The main purpose of this center actually is to serve the oil sector and to be the R&D arm uh, uh, you know, of the petroleum uh, industry in Kuwait. It has a foundation. Uh, it is. Uh, uh, the first in the region. It was started in 1967, so it has uh, a fairly amount of maturation. The development of technologies in different areas is a continuous process. Why you develop every time? Because there is a need, there is a requirement, there is a way that you have to find a cost-effectiveness uh, technology, uh, impressed technology which can fulfill your requirement. There is enormous challenges. Uh, that the petroleum industry uh, is facing and those uh, challenges definitely need innovative answers. We are concentrating on how to improve the reserved oil in, in the country, how, uh, how we can probably develop technologies to improve the, uh, the recovery. In this center we have five type of programs. Each program is focus in one area in the field. First program, we call it Enhance or Recovery. Enhance or Recovery means their work is totally with the upstream. The reservoir is the more uh, complex part of the earth geology. And as we go to deeper and more difficult oil, we need more understanding. This way we will enhance our capability of producing at lower costs. If we develop a technology which has to do related to enhance oil recovery, increasing the production, 
uh, this technology, of course, can be used in any other country, in the GCC countries or in the world, uh, based on how much effective is this technology. Another two programs, we call one of them optimization refining processes, and we have a refining capacity flexibility. These two programs under the uh, downstream process. This program particularly deals with the hydro processing. Hydro processing means you treat the petroleum fraction in the presence of the catalyst and the hydrogen. We uh, have a number of patents related to the spin catalyst in, where, in which we try to develop a technology to recover the metals as well as to reuse this, uh, this spin catalyst. This can be used everywhere if it is acceptable and then commercialized. We are very good in catalysis monitoring. Also, we have now for producing the catalyst as well. We're preparing of the catalyst evaluation and also we are doing it in our labs. We have here a very a unique lab. We call it pilot plant, which is simplified from the refinery. We try to align our research activities with the requirement needed by KNPC and at the same time, uh, having this facility, which, which I'm talking now here, uh, is give us the opportunity, because this considered a small refinery, which is mimicking the real refinery. It's operational 24 hours. So if we target a certain specific product, so we can make a full study, giving the results upon the completion of the results, giving it to, to the client, namely KNPC, there is a, a great potential to they use it on the commercial units. It's important because uh, the, the refinery and all the technology are changing with the years, okay, in order to take account of the environment. Uh, but more you take account of the environment, you reduce the gain of the refinery. You have to maintain your gain and uh, respecting the environment. Because of this, we are developing this technology that they are taking account all these elements. Petroleum refining, you are processing specific uh, feedstock, but this is feedstock's also properties is changing. So you need to develop catalyst. As the property changes, the sulfur content, for example, the sulfur content is increasing. So what technology that you have to use in order to reduce the sulfur to be accepted uh, worldwide so the people, they can buy your, your uh, commodity or your product uh, which is meeting the uh, international standards. So the demand for technology development is always there. Fourth one, which is the corrosion, corrosion assessment and mitigation. And here it's falling into two areas, which is downstream and upstream, and to prevent any kind of failures happens in the future. Cost of corrosion for the oil industry is in millions. Imagine a simple failure in a refinery, a crack in a vessel or a pipe or a reactor. It means for the refinery shutdown of a unit and uh, they take several days to change the uh, damaged uh, piece of equipment. So you lose production for several days. The last one, which would be petrochemicals. In our program, we are focused on enhancing the product properties and we are focusing as well on trying to engineer high performance uh, polymers. In these two uh, solutions, we can help the, the, the sector to be more competitive in comparison with the market and international market products. There are many, many technologies worldwide, but uh, which technology would suit uh, the reservoir that you have? Imagine in, uh, in, uh, not only each country has uh, its own uh, oil uh, properties, but each well, each well, they, it has its own characteristics. So in this case, you have to really look into technology to produce what we call it, this type of uh, crude oil, which is under category of non-conventional oil recovery. That's why we introduced the improved oil recovery, the enhanced oil recovery, to produce the heavier feedstock. We're also uh, responsible to have uh, staff to be well-skilled and trained, Kuwaiti staff in particular, also having students from university, from public authority, to, 
to having their, uh, for example, their thesis or something like that. So we, we work collaboratively with those uh, affiliation in order to, uh, to end up with high caliber uh, staff that can, can not only be used at Kisar, but also in the oil sector. We have to really be ready and confident in, in, in our research projects that we conduct and uh, also uh, to be highly recognized and acknowledged uh, uh, for, for the science and technology and innovation uh, locally, regionally and internationally. I think the needs require such institute to exist not only in Kuwait and the region but all over the world because energy uh, is uh, one of the main factors that uh, impact uh, sustainability. We have a fantastic team. We have a marvelous equipment under one roof. So it is a really a platform to start directional uh, research in all kinds. The vision is clear now. Uh, based on the, this close relationship that we have, now it's getting more and clearer and clearer to us exactly how to, where to focus and how to probably achieve these, uh, these uh, plans that we, we set.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The session will begin in two minutes. Thank you for your patience. Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The plenary partnering for success is, is about to start. I'd like to introduce the session chair, Ferenc Horvath, executive vice president of MOL, Hungary, and he is going to lead uh, this section, uh, session, starting with his presentation. Mr. Horvath, please take the floor. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The topic of our today's plenary session is probably, I think, the most complex one partnering for success. Even if I think of ourselves a uh, human being, I think this is the biggest challenge for ourselves, to find a good partner, to find good partners, or to find a good partnership. In spite of the fact that in case of ourselves, this is a kind of an instinct coming from our nature that we seek partners. And that's what makes us human and that's everywhere with us. We are seeking for partners and there is a desire, a vision to have partners. In a business that's a little bit different or at least what I experienced. That's not an instinct in case of a business or in case of companies and corporations to seek for partners. The number one or the first question is always arising that do we need partners? And in the past, actually companies or corporations answered that not really, we can do everything on our own. And this is rather a, a kind of a winner's takes all mentality that we do everything ourselves. So the first point, decision point is, do we need partners at all? And if yes, why we need the partners and how we can keep the partners, how we can keep partnerships successful. And at this moment, I started to think about uh, successful partnership 
for successful uh, cooperation. And my first experience or memory was a kind of a movie experience. Maybe you have seen the movie from uh, the 40s of the last century, the famous Casablanca. And then you would not be surprised on the sentence what I put there, that all partnership starts or, or it was said that the beginning of a beautiful friendship. So for those who has not seen the film, I put the film, but there is no voice. They are expensive. Our expenses. Mm -hmm. Louis, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. So even without knowing the content, I think it was coming true that the people were kind of trusting each other, and that was kind of comfortable relationship. And they have agreed on something, but definitely, while well, I still remember that for me, that was a good example of entering into a partnership, and I had a good hope that this will continue or this will long lostly, uh, last longly. Louis, but there is another film I from the 90s. The beginning of beautiful friendship. But as you can see, the sentence and the content is the same. Anyhow, my impression and my feelings after that was not the same. So I was not that much comfortable that that partnership is the partnership I want to go, and that partnership will survive longly. Uh, <clears throat> and now let's see that uh, what makes this big difference between a successful and a non-successful partnerships. And as you can see, I put a lot of questions. And all the questions generally about why and how we can decide on a good partnership to enter, why and whom to choose in the partnership, and how to behave during the partnership cooperation in order to maintain or in order to reach the successful partnership. And uh, I can continue the way of the questions and probably as many questions, as many decision points in a partnership, which is very difficult to answer what is the right answer or the right approach. For me, still the basic issue in case of a successful partnership, like in a personal life, the same in the professional life, is always to create or to add value to our partners what they need. And this is important what they need because we might have a lot of values and we can add a lot of values what we believe that the other may seek, but that's not a real value. The real partnership is relying on a connection when both partners giving, adding some value what the other needs. Um, <clears throat> So what, is, what are the values or what are the drivers of this value-adding uh, activities for the partners? I think the, the most important, these three kind of pillars or dimensions, the first one is definitely an access to resources, mainly in case of an upstream company, or access to markets, that's mainly for the, or uh, marketplaces for a downstream company. And the second, big driver is how to mitigate risk. Partners seeking some risk sharing independently whether the risk is geopolitical, political, price risk, market risk, financial risk, or whatever. There is a risk sharing uh, vision and request from the parties. And the third one is the technology. Independently whether it's a completely new technology or it's an advanced technology, but that's also an access to new technologies. More group is my company. We have three main divisions, upstream, downstream, and consumer services. And if you will allow me, I will bring some examples of hopefully successful partnership from our own life. But before going to that, let me briefly give you some information about our group. Mall Group is a mid-cap integrated oil and gas company with a very strong focus on customers. As you can see, we have a small upstream production, a little bit more than 110 
thousand barrel per day equivalent. We have almost 20 million tons of oil processing, refinery uh, production, petrochemical productions and sales concentrated in Central Europe in 12 countries. Uh, we have a headquarter in Budapest. The company is listed in the stock exchange and our biggest shareholder is the Hungarian government with 25% shares. And as you can see, we have more than 2,000 retail service stations in the area and more than 1 million transactions with our direct customers on a daily basis. So firstly, I will uh, bring you and I will show you an example from our upstream activity. As you can see, the total upstream production is 110,000 barrel per day. Out of that, almost 80% is coming from our domestic exploration and production area from Hungary and from Croatia. And in the last 15 years, more upstream activity was trying to, to be involved in more exploration and production project outside internationally, not in our countries, but in other foreign countries, as you can see the different regions also on the map. And in that journey, we had some successful partnerships and we had some less successful partnerships. So this time I decided to uh, take and to show you a very successful uh, partnership, which is lasting now more than 15 years. Mole became a leading oil and gas firm in Pakistan, operating an 80,000 barrel per day uh, production unit, 40 kilometers from the Afghan border. In the last 15 years, we had 13 uh, discoveries and a lot of good results, but probably the most surprising part that we are operating that block with a little bit less than 9% ownership of the project and we have four additional partners, mainly from Pakistan, and maybe national oil companies who are involved, and we are still operating <coughs> at the block. And I'm very proud uh, of the company and the stakeholder management uh, in Pakistan, because we became a reputed strategic partner of the country and of the government, and we are a very much trusted operator of the block. And, uh, a valuable GB partner for the others. Now let's take another example from downstream. Uh, as the president mentioned, I'm head of downstream in Mole, so this is a little bit more for my home area. And once we are talking about Mole downstream activity, I would like to also to mention that last year we came out with our 2030 strategic vision. We call it Mole Group 2030 where we have two main growth areas for our downstream activity. One is uh, the petrochemical growth, where we will shift some fuel production and fuel sales into petrochemicals. And in case of petrochemicals, instead of going for the commodities, we rather go forward in the value chain for a non-commodity production and sales. So that is the uh, next example. And it's not a surprise that that's not a commodity production. As you know, we have a lot of C4 fraction coming out from our refineries. We have four refineries in the region and two petrochemical complexes. So a lot of C4 uh, fraction coming out. Based on this C4, we have built a butadiene plant in Hungary. And based on that butadiene plant, we will build uh, SSBR synthetic rubber production unit and to build and to operate that uh, we made a partnership with the worldwide leading technology and market provider Japanese synthetic rubber company based on all the main value added drivers this is a present partnership we started two and a half years ago and we will finish the plant next year and we will start the operation from next year. So I can't say anything about the final results, but probably in 2030 I can report about good results of that partnership as well. And the third example I, I bring not even from the past, as in case of upstream or from the present times for downstream, 
but a little bit <clears throat> for the future. As you remember, I mentioned that in our 2030 downstream strategy, we have one growth area, this is the petrochemicals, and the other, we say this is the consumer services. With our 2,000 retail uh, service station in the region, we are a leading traditional, I would say, fuel retailer. And what we visioned for 2030, that we will be a leading service provider in the region for all the cars and for all the passengers uh, when they are on the move, independently whether they will use a fossil fuel or whether we need any other fuel or any other alternatives. And we will mainly concentrate not only on the fuel for the car, but for all the services what passengers or people or whoever or companies, B2C or B2B, may need when they are on the move. And the opportunities and the growth areas are very wide <clears throat> on that activity. So what we can see that uh, becoming the leading service provider in this consumer services or the mobility services, there are a lot of opportunities to make good partnership because whoever will go for this mobility service providing activity, the IT platform, the quality, the speed, and actually the, uh, the service to the customers of the IT platform will be one of the most important. So there is a great opportunity for these partnerships in creating the IT platform. The next alternative for new and uh, value-added uh, partnerships in, in case of the uh, stations themselves, the service stations, because currently, as I mentioned, we are a traditional fuel retailers with selling fuel and some shop products. But in order to serve all the possible demand from the consumers within 15 years, we might seek a lot of value-added partnerships from companies who are dealing with producing goods or sell, selling or producing services in the convenience or in the consumer industry. The third opportunity is also coming from our visioning that we believe that autonomous car driving and car sharing will be a very important dimension and very important area for the next 10, 15, 20 years. The customer habits and the customer experiences recently changing very quickly. And I don't think that within 15 years, the most important thing for people would be to own a car, rather to own a mileage or to have the opportunity to quickly, as quick and as comfortable as possible to go from A to B. And in that way, definitely, there is a opportunity to make partnerships and valuable partnerships in uh, car sharing and then Somehow we will have to manage uh, this fleet, what we will have, so there is a new opportunity also in the fleet management. But that's about the future, and that's not the total list. But what I want to say, that what we see, that more and more opportunities and more and more needs are evolving in that area. The big question, whether who will be successful or who will be clever enough to do good partnerships. And at the end, let's try to, to summarize uh, my, my short introduction and a little bit to see what are the main criteria, the main success factors in uh, being successful in, a partnership, in partnering. There are some basic criteria or basic success factors which were always there and which probably will be always there, like the, the mutual benefit, the value uh, proposition, uh, all these basics for me, mainly about financials, facts, expectations, and uh, that's not a big miracle, and that was the way 10 years ago, and probably that will be the way within the next 10 years, how one make a decision for a partnership. But the big difference for me uh, are in the, in the often forgotten soft elements. Because even if the financials or the assumptions are great at the beginning of the partnership, 
I think the, the biggest uh, and the most often pitfall is uh, that there is a missing trust or credibility between the partners or the corporate culture is very much diverging, which doesn't give an opportunity to work together. So for me personally, the trust and the credibility between the partners, that's probably the number one issue in case of a long lasting strategic partnership. And then secondly, currently our environment is so much volatile that even in the best assumption cases, we have a lot of unexpected surprises during the operation. And their partners need to have an aligned risk appetite and also need to have a flexibility to change their priorities within these turmoil uh, circumstances. And lastly, also as a result of a successful partnership, we see all these new ventures. And personally, I believe that the autonomy of the ventures, of course, within a well-defined frames, it's very important that the partners should not want to run the, the venture, but should give an autonomy and the responsibility and opportunity the venture to develop their own business. So that was my thoughts about uh, successful partnering. And now let me invite His Excellency Sheikh uh, Mohammed, Minister of uh, Oil of uh, Bahrain, to share with us his thoughts about uh, successful partnering. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, good night. Uh, allow me first of all to uh, extend my thanks and appreciation to the WPC and congratulate them for what has been a, a fantastic event. I think it uh, exceeded everybody's expectation. My thanks go also to uh, the Republic of Turkey and His Excellency uh, Mr. Al Bayraq, uh, the Minister. It has been a great event, uh, very much anticipated, and as we come into this final day in session, I'm sure it's been an exciting set of discussions and, uh, and things to talk about. Now, in partnership, I will uh, focus on why partnership is needed. But before I do that, I, I believe that there are two sets of opinions when it comes to where the industry is, the petroleum, oil and gas industry. So th those that believe in peak demand, and they say that uh, with renewable energy, with the environmental issues, uh, there is a, a real challenge looming into the future, and we might see peak demand approaching soon. The other opinion is closer to the concept of peak supply, i.e. because of the sharp drop in oil prices, uh, there is a big uh, supply problem uh, that's going to happen in, in the next few years at least. And then of course, uh, the third opinion is you don't want to say where you are, you just say I'm between, there's no peak oil and there's no peak, uh, peak uh, demand issue. Uh, for, my opinion is they're probably both right. One is short term and the other is a bit long term. But it's very important to understand what the real challenges are. So if you look at the peak demand uh, set of opinions, it's really based on uh, renewable energy as, as one thing, saying that the electric vehicles uh, and other renewable sources of energy like solar and wind uh, will cause a dent into, into the demand side of things, and the environment as well comes into play. Uh, there's also a notion of a potential abundant supply of hydrocarbon, uh, especially with the advent of shale oil and uh, shale gas. But if we look at the numbers, I think reality strikes it a, bit, a bit differently. You should always check. When you hear a, set, a series of information, you should always check. So um, I'm sure you heard about the, uh, the volume of cars and electric vehicles being sold in the world. Uh, like one thing that we don't realize is an electric car like a Tesla c consumes around 60 kilograms of lithium. Now, the global production of lithium is not more than 35,000 tons. So the world produces 35,000 tons of lithium. Now, if you're going to produce a Tesla, 
And the current production limits you at a maximum of 600,000 cars. And lithium is not solely focused on electric vehicles. So you're actually limited in a different commodity there. And people fail, fail to see that that is going to be an enormous limiting factor uh, for electric vehicles to actually really overtake. I mean, I, I, this was mentioned in a, one of the sessions that electric vehicles and hybrids make up only 1%. But what people don't realize is that lithium, the major component of battery production, is a very limited resource. You cannot scale it up, which tells you that maybe it's not realistic to expect electric vehicles uh, to really make up the volume of cars that needs to be sold. You talk to Tesla, they're not worried about lithium, they're worried about another commodity that they use, cobalt. Uh, for now, you know that there are two other commodities that, if you believe in electric vehicles, are going to be extremely valuable. Maybe an investment decision to make, and if you make uh, any profits, uh, I should get a cut, I told you about this, and that's an example of partnership. Uh, so, uh, I think that puts a dent into the issue of peak demand. Can electric vehicles and renewables really replace hydrocarbons? I think the other challenge is the notion of an abundant hydrocarbon resource. Uh, what really took everybody by surprise and, and caused the supply glut that ended up having an issue of an inventory overhang that's causing all the price problems these days is the, the U.S. shale boom. And uh, again, that's an industry that outside the U.S. we don't know uh, very much about. I think the notion that uh, it is unlimited might not be realistic. Now, if you look at the details of the information that comes out of the U.S., uh, they are beginning to, heat, to hit certain peaks in some of the plays. They've got the Bakken, the Permian, uh, and the other plays in the U.S. The Permian being the youngest and the most prolific is already at 85% water cut. And what that, what that means is that you're challenged for the future. Uh, so when experts like Woodmac in, uh, in supply demand dynamics tell you that there could be a 5 million uh, barrel a day supply deficit by 2020 or 2022, you know, there's a basis for that projection. And I think that is the issue we're looking at. So the main problem comes back to, you have, with shale, a huge resource. But that doesn't mean they are reserves. There's a difference between having a resource base and having recoverable reserves. So yes, the resource base is huge, but at the current prices and maybe the current technology applied, they cannot be produced. So the recoverable from those reserves does not really meet the, the expected demand. Until, unless prices really readjust. And that's the problem that was created in 2015 up till now. And we really haven't seen the price levels that are needed to unlock those resources and make them reserves. This brings us back to the importance of partnership. This industry, which you are all a part of, is almost $2 trillion. It is the largest industry in the world. And in terms of commodities, it eats up all the other commodities combined. They don't even come close. So the hydrocarbon industry is, is one of the largest and starts from the up upstream services to the midstream, downstream, delivery, all of that is fully integrated. And partnership is not at the JV level, at the upstream only, but it trickles down into all of this. So you've got all the services that you can think of that work to make the system operable and delivering energy to the rest of the world. Uh, if you talk about service companies in the upstream, we have Halliburton with us, uh, maybe Schlumberger, now Baker Hughes with the merger of GE and Weatherford. They're taking some, I think, courageous steps into taking a little bit more risk and applying their technology to do just that, convert the resource into reserves. And we see it in the region. Uh, I think we very much appreciate this drive and, uh, and I think it's the right approach. If, if you believe in what the geology is telling us, we need to do a lot just to meet demand by 2020, 2022. Uh, the problem of really having a shortage is a very big one. We really need, really need to look at the numbers. 
for a lot of technology and work has to be applied now to even attempt to solve the problem. Uh, and I think uh, the partnership with service companies is certainly one approach. IOCs, of course, are applying themselves heavily in, in the United States uh, shale revolution. I mean, they came in late, but uh, you know, I think they will, they will push technology to the limits and reduce the cost of production. Now, can you move on into the downstream business? With all the environmental regulations, there's a lot of pressure on process technology, on health, safety, and the environment, partnership at every level. We've, uh, in the Gulf, we've set up uh, an association for uh, refineries and petrochemicals called the Gulf Downstream Association. Uh, Mr. Rashidi is the uh, president. He's with us here today, but that's another kind of partnership where people collaborate in the operation of refineries, on the reliability, all of that. That's very important. You've got the professional societies and the upstream side, the societies of geosciences, societies of petroleum engineering, uh, process technology, all collaborating to make sure that this industry continues uh, to operate safely, continues to have the right environmental specs. Um, you know, there's a huge pressure on cleaner hydrocarbons, desulfurizing, uh, fuel oil now with the IMO regulations. All of that requires collaboration at every level, from the process technology side to uh, the operation of the facilities to investments. When you come to the investments, a lot of investments are needed to really upgrade the quality of uh, refinery production. Well, I mean, the sulfur issue is going to be a center stage by 2020. I mean, it's a very short period of time where high sulfur fuel oil will have no market. What's going to happen? So uh, a huge investment needs to go into old refineries, up upgrading the facilities, getting the quality, another type of partnership. Who's going to get the funding? Mobilizing funding is another level of partnership. You've got export credit agencies coming in today to bridge the cap project finance because banks can really no longer do it with all the strict regulations. Uh, legal services, all of those come in to support each other. Uh, uh, but the partnership runs across a very wide net. Uh, and that's uh, really what I wanted to focus my talk on. Now for Bahrain, we uh, heavily rely on gas as our primary source of energy. And for a small country of less than 2 million population, we have 7 gigawatts of installed power. Uh, that's one of the reasons is we have one of the largest smelters. And we need to continually increase our sources of gas. We are building an LNG terminal, but at the same time, we're increasing the domestic gas, and we're looking into more difficult resources. Resources that in the past were maybe too expensive to, to produce, but now, and I think with the available technology in partnership uh, with service companies, become viable. And we're working on that at the gas front, at the uh, oil front as well. Uh, it's a similar theme globally. And uh, the message is because of the uh, reduction in investment, uh, a serious supply issue looms in the next four and five years. And unfortunately, the only solution to that is a higher oil price. Uh, that is going to take time uh, purely because of where the sentiment is today. People and markets actually believe and are worried about the principle of peak demand, uh, electric vehicles, uh, and their potential impact. I mean, there is that worry that maybe hydrocarbons uh, are a sunsetting industry. We've heard that before. Uh, but uh, it is always dangerous to believe too much in new technology that has yet not been developed. Uh, and I think we, uh, we really need, need to go back to our roots. This industry continuously suffers from these sharp volatility spikes. And it affects it in all sorts of manner, not only in the supply-demand dynamics, but also in the manpower. And in the 90s, people moved out of the industry. We had a shortage by the time the boom hit. We had a shortage of engineers, petroleum engineers, geoscientists, operators in the field globally. The longer this current slump takes, <clears throat> the, prob the problem becomes uh, even bigger with, uh, with the lack of resources. But uh, that's the message I wanted to uh, give out. Hopefully I had some 
interesting information to share. Uh, the lithium issue is uh, maybe a, a new one, so uh, go and research lithium and cobalt. Uh, those are interesting commodities if you believe in the electric vehicle. Find a company and invest in it. If you don't, don't invest. So, uh, again, thank you very much uh, for your attention, and uh, I'll hand over to my next uh, speaker. Thank you very much. His Excellency, thank you very much. I'm, I'm not an agent of Tesla, I have to say, and not an agent of an electric car uh, production company, and I've been working 34 years in the oil industry, always dealing with downstream uh, activities. But as to the future, I still see that beside upstream and uh, refinery-oriented partnership, there will be more and more room for partnership for customers. Because that's what I feel from time to time, that we are not talking enough, and these are the customers. And why I'm saying that, because uh, uh, the customer habits uh, and the new customer expectations and the experience what customers want to have within 10, 15, 20 years, that will have a major impact into our industry. So that's why what we are saying that, as you could see from my presentation, that yes, we consider partnerships in upstream, very important, the resources, but we already, and we focus very much on partnership for customers as well. And now, uh, I would like to announce our next uh, speaker, Mr. Zishan Syed, Executive Vice President of Corporate Development International Relations from i Canada. Please welcome him. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. A topic about partnerships is music to the ears of a Canadian. Indeed, Canada is a country whose very ethos relates to success through global partnerships. Against the backdrop of major technological, social, economic, and political disruptive forces we've heard about this week, a dialogue of unity, cooperation, co-creation, really, and multi-institutional partnerships is an important one. I thank the WPC for organizing today's event and providing the platform to tell the story that led to the creation of the International Centre of Regulatory Excellence, or i -Corps. Born in Canada, its vision really is to be a United Nations of regulators. You hear often at conferences and in, in these dialogues the importance of the regulatory agent. And it's our belief in Canada that uh, an extreme focus on regulatory excellence is an ultimate pursuit for all of us to share. Canada, as you know, is one of the largest oil reserves in the world. We rank third behind Saudi Arabia and Venezuela. And the province of Alberta is a key player in Canada's energy industry. Indeed, the province of Alberta and Canada's rich resource endowment has contributed to the prosperous and open and stable society for our citizens and has attracted market opportunities for international investors. The basis for this success is our strong convictions to govern the development of energy resources that subscribes to the highest principles of regulatory excellence. As Canada celebrates its 150th anniversary, government regulators, stakeholders, and our citizens are deeply engaged in a national dialogue to chart a course towards Canada's renewed energy future. Canada's dialogue is shared by energy-producing jurisdictions around the world, as we all find ourselves at the nexus of social, economic, and geopolitical forces that are redefining the world's energy future. At the center of this dialogue, however, is the need to rethink our approach to regulatory policy that conform to the new realities 
of an evolving energy paradigm. The regulatory community globally requires reform and needs to break out of its traditional role of transactional agencies and adopt a new managerial style to become agents of transformative change. And at the heart of this change is embracing an ethos of regulatory excellence that permeates throughout the very fabric of all of our institutions. For this to happen, regulators around the world will need to come together and collectively take bold and courageous actions to position themselves for future success in an energy system that is in transition. So today I'd like to illustrate three broad strategic themes that are compelling regulators all over the world, including our own, to find innovative solutions to deliver on our mandates. I would also like to discuss how i is playing a leading role to provide the global regulatory community a collaborative environment to design, apply, and test new innovative solutions to address key operational challenges that confront us all. Our engagement with regulators in Canada all over the world over the last few years has revealed that the underlying currents of disruptive change can be best described along three broad themes. The imperative to secure a sustainable energy future for the benefit of society, the need to conform the crisis of public confidence in regulatory systems by renewing our social contract with citizens and stakeholders that is inclusive, responsive, and empathetic. And the need to foster alternative approaches to regulation that conform to new frontiers in global energy markets. First, sustainability imperative. As we've heard this week, one of the defining problems facing governments and industry in the 21st century is to crack the sustainability puzzle. That is, providing the world with reliable, affordable, and accessible sources of energy that is safe, environmentally sustainable, and to ensure the development of energy resources serves as a catalyst for building prosperous, stable, and equitable societies. This means the regulators have to rethink the basic notion of governing the development of energy resources through a sustainable development lens that looks at achieving the long-term stability of the economy and the environment. The only way to achieve this is to change the focus of regulation from a traditional oversight mandate to managing the performance of the energy system in an integrated manner with a focus on outcomes. Second, the erosion of public trust and confidence. The public's view towards energy development is evolving and becoming more fragmented. Today, national interests in some cases are subordinated by local and regional interests. The public is also becoming less deferential and indeed skeptical towards centralized forms of governmental authority that too often understate the importance of community values. And citizens are demanding more assurances from regulatory authorities that development risks to safety and the environment are well managed. This is the new social reality we live in, which cannot be ignored. And hence, this means regulators will have to build their analytical capabilities as a core function and provide transparent, credible, and unbiased views of the state and performance of the energy system with a focus on science and evidence. Further, the application of digital platforms to manage the emergence of open source big data will likely have the potential to introduce tremendous value for regulators and regulated sectors by making optimal decisions efficiently and transparently. Finally, regulatory systems need a primary focus on empathic engagement that extends beyond standard administrative consultation requirements. At the heart of regulation is people, and people need to form part of the larger regulatory agenda that dictate the patterns of resource development on a global scale. Third, new frontiers in global energy markets. Most ENP companies are reassessing their longer-term competitive position relative to some of the changes in global energy markets. From resource scarcity to resource abundance 
the world finds itself awash in hydrocarbon resources, creating a low-priced environment that is volatile and uncertain. The Paris Climate Accord and the Grand Energy Transition are placing into motion national strategies to move towards carbon-constrained economies. The rise of renewable energy and the advent of disruptive changes in transportation, as he, His Excellency mentioned, are ch challenging the market supremacy of petroleum products. And natural gas is clearly emerging as a global commodity to serve as a bridge fuel to a low-carbon economy. All of this means that regulatory authorities have to focus on sustaining lean and agile regulatory systems that allow for new E&P business models to flourish and allow them to test innovative approaches to producing and delivering the energy the world needs. Finally, regulators have to build a credible approach to overseeing the development of unconventional resources that subscribes to the highest standards of regulatory excellence, protects people, the environment, and provides for an innovative and competitive business environment that serve the interests of society. Given these challenges, Canada has taken the lead in creating i not only as a platform to share knowledge and experience, but also as a safe and innovative space for regulators to come together and co-create practical solutions to some of these challenges. Officially launched earlier this year, i is a nonpartisan, not-for-profit organization dedicated to creating a global platform for world-class regulatory training, collaboration, and innovation. Built by regulators, for regulators, i can build, innovate, and reimagine regulatory systems. Drawing on expertise from at home and abroad, i will be the global center of regulatory excellence in the natural resources sector. To achieve this, i is focusing on three distinct but interrelated operational streams that will set the bar for regulatory excellence. First, training. i is delivering professional tra tailored training and development to enable specific technical capacity. As we note in Canada, there is no regulator school in the world, and the royal jelly lies in that bespoke training. Second, innovation. i is creating a global innovation lab, a multidisciplinary platform focused on bringing together ideas, experts, and knowledge to promote international standards. And lastly, advisory. i will help enhance and accelerate the business improvement journey of individual regulators to achieve excellence by providing direct, expert-led, strategic, and operational advice. I'm proud to state that i inaugural founding member is the country of Mexico in an official launch we had in Mexico City in April this year. We are also working with a few international partners, such as the IEA and Dr. Biral, the OECD, and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, as well as the countries of Argentina and Ukraine. Canada is recognized as a secure, reliable source of energy, and i will assure we are also a global source of regulatory excellence. In conclusion, like everyone, we've had to adapt to changes in government and new policies, increase stakeholder and public expectations, and an evolving energy paradigm. Regulatory excellence is about transforming ourselves into a regulator that continually improves our work building strong relationships with our diverse and varied stakeholders and leading the next era in energy regulation. The level of vision, innovation, and partnerships required to deliver such an ambitious goal requires energy regulators to elevate their organizational cap capabilities to a level of operational excellence. i can help any regulator achieve this. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Zishan. So I think uh, our time is expired and we have to give the floor to the next plenary meeting. So thank you very much uh, to His Excellency and to Zishan for their presentation and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. <laughs>
Kuwait Institute for Scientific Research established this research center, which is the Petroleum Research Center, with the aim to make it a regionally recognized center of excellence uh, in both upstream and downstream technologies. The main purpose of this center actually is to serve the oil sector and to be the R&D arm uh, uh, you know, of the petroleum uh, industry in Kuwait. It has a foundation. Uh, it is uh, uh, the first in the region. It was started in 1967. So it has uh, a fairly amount of maturation. The development of technologies in different areas is a continuous process. Why you develop every time? Because there is a need, there is a requirement, there is a way that you have to find a cost-effectiveness uh, technology, uh, impressed technology which can fulfill your requirement. There is enormous challenges uh, that the petroleum industry uh, is facing. And those uh, challenges definitely need innovative answers. We are concentrating on how to improve the reserved oil in, in the country. How, uh, how we can probably develop technologies to improve the, uh, the recovery. In this center, we have five type of programs. Each program is focused in one area in the field. First program we call it enhance or recovery. Enhance or recovery means their work is totally with the upstream. The reservoir is the more uh, complex part of the earth geology and as we go to deeper and more difficult oil we need more understanding. This way we will enhance our capability of producing at lower costs. If we develop a technology which has to do related to enhance oil recovery, increasing the production. Uh, this technology, of course, can be used in any other country, in the GCC countries or in the world, uh, based on how much effective is this technology. Another two programs, we call one of them optimization refining processes, and we have a refining capacity flexibility. These two programs under the uh, downstream process. This program particularly deals with the hydro processing. Hydro processing means you treat the petroleum fraction in the presence of the catalyst and the hydrogen. We uh, have a number of patents related to the spin catalyst in, where, in which we try to develop a technology to recover the metals as well as to reuse this, uh, this spin catalyst. This can be used everywhere if it is acceptable and then commercialized. We are very good in catalysis monitoring. Also, we have now for producing the catalyst as well, we preparing of the catalyst evaluation, and also we are doing it in our labs. We have it here, very a unique lab. We call it pilot plant, which is simplified from the refinery. We try to align our research activities with the requirement needed by KNPC and at the same time, uh, having this facility, which, which I'm talking now here, uh, is give us the opportunity, because this consider a small refinery, which is mimicking the real refinery. It's operational 24 hours. So if we target a certain specific product, so we can make a full study, giving the results upon the completion of the results, giving it to, to the client, namely KNPC, there is a, a great potential to they use it on the commercial units. It's important because uh, the, the refinery and all the technology are changing with the years, okay, in order to take account of the environment. Uh, but more you take account of the environment, you reduce the gain of the refinery. You have to maintain your gain uh, respecting the environment. Because of this, we are developing this technology that they are taking account of all these elements. Petroleum refining, you are processing specific uh, feedstock, but this is feedstock also properties is changing, so you need to develop catalyst. As the property changes, the sulfur content, for example, the sulfur content is increasing. So what technology that you have to use in order to reduce the sulfur, to be accepted uh, worldwide, so the people, they can buy your, your uh, commodity or your product, which is meeting the uh, international standards.
So the demand for technology development is always there. Fourth one, which is the corrosion, corrosion assessment and mitigation. And here it's falling into two areas, which is downstream and upstream, and to prevent any kind of failures happens in the future. Cost of corrosion for the oil industry is in millions. Imagine a simple failure in a refinery, a crack in a vessel or a pipe or a reactor. It means for the refinery shutdown of a unit and uh, they take several days to change the uh, damaged uh, piece of equipment. So you lose production for several days. The last one, which will be petrochemicals. In our program, we are focused on enhancing the product properties. And we are focusing as well on trying to engineer high-performance uh, polymers. In these two solutions, we can help the, the, the sector to be more competitive in comparison with the market and international market products. There are many, many technologies worldwide, but uh, which technology would suit uh, the reservoir that you have? Imagine in, uh, in, uh, not only each country has uh, its own uh, oil uh, properties, but each well, each well, they, it has its own characteristics. So in this case, you have to really look into technology to produce what we call it, this type of uh, crude oil, which is under category of non-conventional oil recovery. That's why we introduced the improved oil recovery, the enhanced oil recovery, to produce the heavier feedstock. We're also uh, responsible to have uh, staff to be well-skilled and trained, Kuwaiti staff in particular, also having students from university, from public authority, to, to having their, uh, for example, their thesis or something like that. So we, we work collaboratively with those uh, affiliation in order to, uh, to end up with high caliber uh, staff that can, can not only be used at Kisar but also in the oil sector. We have to really be ready and confident in, in, in our research projects that we conduct and uh, also uh, to be highly recognized and acknowledged uh, uh, for, for the science and technology and innovation uh, locally, regionally and internationally. I think the needs require such institute to exist not only in Kuwait and the region but all over the world because energy uh, is uh, one of the main factors that uh, impact uh, sustainability. We have a fantastic team, we have a marvelous equipment under one roof, so it is a really a platform to start directional uh, research in all kinds. The vision is clear now, uh, based on the, this close relationship that we have. For new realities, I'll feel more comfortable standing and talking. My name is Sanjeev Singh. I'm chairman Indian Oil Corporation Limited, and I'll be the chair of this session. I mean, before I invite the speakers for this interesting topic, let me share with you a few things about my company. It's the largest business enterprise of India, a $70 billion company. Small presence in upstream, a large presence in downstream. We operate 11 of 23 refineries of the country, we have nearly 26,000 retail outlets. We are the largest retail outlet downstream company in the country. Uh, today's topic is uh, strategies for new realities. Probably the big question is, even before we talk about strategies, I mean, what exactly are the new realities today? We have seen the oil and gas sector changing significantly during the last, say, three years or so, particularly since October 14 when the oil prices fell down. The situation is seen or experienced by different regions, different countries differently. While the low prices pose a different kind of challenge for uh, producing uh, companies, I mean, they pose or they offer a different kind of opportunities for oil-consuming countries, particularly like India. 
But one thing all of us cannot deny that probably the technology has made a lot of changes. When the oil prices started falling, I mean, we all anticipated that uh, the break even for the shale oil would be around $70, $75. And today we all know that it is below $40. And this all could be possible by uh, technology. There are a couple of things which are in everybody's mind, especially those who are in this sector or related with this sector. I mean, these are the disruption predominantly by e-mobility. Now, uh, although the growth of oil and gas is uh, fairly certain, I mean, what numbers are visible today across the globe, I mean, some, some regions it is less, some regions it is very high. But we can't deny that uh, e-mobility e may be a disruptor for tomorrow. Gas prices, gas is again coming in a very big way for, uh, as an alternative for the conventional liquid fuels. And the gas mechanism or the gas business is also seeing drastic changes in these days. The definition of long term itself has changed. The long term used to be 15 years, 20 years. Today we are talking about a long term of three years. So the basic definitions are getting changed. The stringent emission compliance in the mobility sector is also going to be probably Pay, uh, play a very, very important role on uh, our business. Oil and gas sector companies are looking for diversification and uh, they are no more the liquid fuel suppliers. They are becoming the energy companies for tomorrow. So I think uh, this is one thing which probably most, most of us are uh, uh, experiencing or uh, we are planning. There are different kind of strategies which different companies or different sectors or different countries are planning today. And it will be worthwhile to listen to two of the experts uh, in this field or who had been associated with this in this field for uh, long. Let me introduce uh, Dr. Sayed Mohammad Adili, who is presently Secretary General uh, Gas Exporting Countries Forum. He was Iran's Deputy Foreign Minister for Economic and Energy Affairs, Governor of the Central Bank, Advisor to the President, Chairman, Board of Directors, National Iranian Gas Export Company, and Ambassador to Japan, Canada, and UK. He was instrumental to Iran's post-war reforms, chief negotiator in many of its gas deals with Pakistan, India, Europe, Armenia, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia. Founder of the Rivan Institute for Economic and International Studies, Dr. Adili has a PhD in Business Administration and a PhD in Economics. I think uh, we, we are lucky to have a person with his experience and uh, caliber. I'm sure that uh, we'll have very interesting things to share with him. Dr. Dili, please. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for your kind uh, introduction. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Let me at the outset express my gratitude from WPC management as well as organizers for the kind invitation to this important meeting at the beautiful and historic city of Istanbul. I would like to congratulate the Turkish government, the city of Istanbul, and WPC for this successful organization and commendable programs. As the Secretary General of Gas Exporting Countries Forum, whose members and observers have now increased to 19 exporting countries, and which is responsible for two-thirds of the world gas reserves and 65% of gas trade, I am pleased to share the following observations on the topical subject of this session with a special reference to natural gas as the fuel of choice. Ladies and gentlemen, it's true that the dynamics of the energy market are with no doubt reshaping the global architecture of the market. And we are in the transitional period. And thus, we should try to opt for a new strategy for the future. However, it is equally true that the fundamentals of the reality on the ground have not changed. The truth is that energy strategy is the strategy of human being development, or it is the strategy for the economic development of human beings. The core subject of the energy strategy is the story of survival 
and the growth of life and the people on the face of earth. Now, what has remained the same is that the population continues to grow. It is expected to grow by 1.7 billion more people in the next 25 years. The urbanization is increasing by around 10%, and the economy is set to grow two and a half times bigger by 2040 compared to today's size of global economy. As a result, the primary energy demand will grow by 30%, almost four gigaton oil equivalent, more by 2040. Therefore, the core question is how we can develop an energy strategy that could satisfy these huge needs and requirements. This is a big and complicated question that needs a sophisticated response. It seems that any energy, any strategy in this field needs to address the following five considerations. First, it should care First, it should care about the security of supply and demand. It should secure a smooth and sustained flow of energy from its producers to the consumers. Second, it increasingly requires to address the climate change concerns, pollutions, and air quality issues. Third, the strategy should introduce sources that are relatively accessible, affordable, and abundant. Fourth, it needs to involve multiple sources of energy if it wants to be sustainable. Single source solution is doomed to fail. Fifth, the strategy must present a global solution for the whole world. It should not be limited to special region or group of countries. Now, I want to argue that more or less all of the above considerations can match natural gas. In fact, any realistic strategy for energy cannot ignore the big role of natural gas. Rather, it should give special priority and importance to gas as we are facing more challenges in the energy field. Meanwhile, the gas market dynamics are also changing rapidly if we want to highlight one single characteristic for the gas market today, we should point at the creation of an environment of competition and flexibility. The competition that gas market is experiencing today is from two aspects. First, from different new gas LNG suppliers, and second, from other fuels, namely coal and heavily subsidized renewables. Although this has posed some challenges, yet it is gradually providing more opportunities to expand its usage in different sectors and regions, thus increasing the gas market share in the energy mix. But the net result is that the present situation is making natural gas more attractive and irresistible to be chosen and used. This competitiveness and the resulting flexibility will contribute to the security of supply, while the security of demand, of course, will remain an issue to be addressed by more stable energy policies. On the second element, the growing concerns about global warming and climate change have already led to the vast commitments by almost all responsible parties. Almost all responsible parties. These parties are making efforts to mitigate CO2 emission, reduce pollution, and promote the air quality. And in a nutshell, they are all strategizing for a low carbon society. This, in turn, has provided excellent opportunities for natural gas to play a key role in this context. To proceed to a low carbon economy, natural gas has a special role to play as it is the cleanest fossil fuel and it can easily beat the coal. And as far as pollution is concerned, health of the people is at the top priorities in the agendas of governments and international organizations 
such as WHO. What matters are the particles emissions as well as NOx and SOx rather than CO2, which is a more global long-term issue. Being a fuel without particulates with less SOx and NOx and less CO2, it is by far safer for human health and less polluting than coal and oil. The other aspect is the relationship between the mitigation of CO2 emission and the use of natural gas. The empirical evidence in China, US, and EU indicate that in all these cases, the use of more gas led to the reduction of CO2 emission. There is a sort of correlation between the mitigation of CO2 with the increasing of gas share in the energy mix. This means that if the parties to the Paris Agreement are keen to reach their target to reduce CO2 emission and to develop a meaningful carbon market, then there would be a very large increase in the demand for gas. The decline of coal and its substitution by gas in these regions contributed significantly to the recently observed emission trends. In China, for instance, total CO2 emission decreased by 1% last year, driven by a decline in coal and surge in natural gas demand by around 8%. In Europe, total CO2 emission were relatively stable, but the power generation emission observed a decrease by more than 4% in 2016 over 2015. Substitution between gas and coal in this sector is a key driver of this CO2 emission reduction, despite some disparities between European countries. In the United States, CO2 emission decreased by 3%, and this, is, this amount is equivalent to the global emission of a country like Algeria, resulting from the increase of the use of gas in power generation by 3.5% while at the same time the coal-fired power plants burned less coal by 8.3%. Therefore, the fact is that even if we endeavor to realize all the commitments of INDCs and NDCs, we will not be able to meet the target of two degrees. We foresee some mismatches between forecasted reference case emissions and emissions resulting from aggregated NDCs targets. The gap is estimated at 2.2 gigaton CO2 by 2030, or 6%. To achieve the Paris Agreement target, efforts beyond the present NDCs is required. This gap is largely supported by the dominance of coal and oil in energy mix. Around 35% of CO2 emission in 2030 are expected to come from coal, we are convinced that natural gas in the, is the solid and authentic solution in this regard. More penetration of gas can further contribute in reducing CO2 and in achieving uh, greenhouse gases emission targets. On the third element, the strategy, uh, which is accessibility and affordability and abundance, natural gas is the fuel that should be taken very seriously. Let me make a brief reference to the cost and affordability of natural gas. The levelized cost in the power generation indicate that natural gas is still undefeatable and very competitive to coal, wind, and solar energy sources. Gas is abundant and accessible from many places and regions, and these makes it more sustainable thus making it the desired source of energy. The fourth element is very important for sustainability, and it requires to provide solutions that include multiple sources of energy to achieve low carbon society. It is good to promote renewables and sell the know-how and, respect and, uh, and res uh, respective technologies. But we should not forget that development of world cannot be achieved by using renewables only. 
We should not be misled by the high momentum of renewables as the fashion of the day and forget investing on other sources of energy and on the top of them natural gas as the cleanest fossil fuel. Last but not the least, the strategy should be a global one, a solution that ad could address the needs of all regions of the world, from South Asia, Africa to Latin America and advanced world. Regional or unilateral policies imposing distortions in the trade of gas for any reason, including geopolitical ones, may not be compatible with the realities on the ground and may not end in the expected result. Let me now summarize in conclusion that we are facing a challenge of rising demand for energy at, this, uh, at the time when we have to be mindful of climate change effects. Therefore, we have no choice but to care about the carbon content of the energy. But at the same time, we should not be overwhelmed by the fashion of the day or the geopolitical considerations that tend to address its problems by distorting the gas trade. All forecasters believe that fossil fuel will remain the dominant source of energy for decades to come. Therefore, we in GECF are confident that natural gas is the fuel of choice because it is gaining momentum in the battle against greenhouse emissions after the Paris Agreement. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Adeli. Now I invite Mr. Peter Coleman, uh, who has over 32 years in experience in the global oil and gas industry covering Asia, Americas, Africa, Australia. Mr. Coleman has been Managing Director and CEO of Woodside since joining the company in May 11. He is also the Chairman of the Australia-Korea Foundation, Chairman of the Advisory Group of Australia-Africa Relations, and Advisor to the Asia Society. He is also a member of the University of Western Australia Business School Board, the Executive Committee of the Australia-Japan Business Cooperation Council, Australia Institute of Company Directors, Australia-India Chief Executive Officers Forum, and Monash Engineering Foundation. Mr. Coleman, please. Well, th thank you, Sanjeev. I, I always uh, I, I wonder where I get time to do my day job when I listen to some of those other things that we uh, are really required to do as leaders in our industry, but they're very important things for us and, and things that we must continue to find the time to support. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, everybody for, for being here today. It's always difficult on the fourth day of the conference to, to, uh, to get up and make the uh, commitments to come along and listen to the speakers. So we very much appreciate your attention uh, and attendance today because this is uh, what we think is a, a very, very important topic. Uh, and uh, of course, we've thanked the conference organisers. We think you've left the best for last today to uh, ensure everybody stays along. Uh, look, uh, in considering our strategies for a new reality, we first need to think about what's changing in the global energy markets and w what change is really still to come. Uh, we can sit up here and, or stand up here and talk as producers around how we think the world or we would like the world to be, but the reality is there's an interaction between consumers and producers. Uh, and we need to make sure that we're aligned uh, going forward as to what those needs are. So we need to define firstly what is that new reality and I'll talk some about that today. Uh, we've already heard that we're in a world of oil and gas with market dynamics shifting quite rapidly and we've seen in recent years some interesting investments both in the supply and demand side and how they're shaping our business environment as we move forward. On the supply side, we've moved from what is colloquially called a period of s supply scarcity now to a period of supply abundance. The advent of shale and, of course, unconventional gas has been a game changer in the industry, bringing the oil cost curve down. And, of course, many of us are still trying to understand the financeability uh, of this business, but nonetheless, it's real and it's here to stay uh, for the long term. For LNG, uh, the business that we're in, of course, the boost in supply has been underpinned by an increase in production from my home, Australia, and a start-up of exports from the Gulf of Mexico, something that was unprecedented and certainly was not in anybody's forecast 10 years ago. 
The volume of LNG traded globally is increasing as well, and the flexibility of that global LNG trade is fundamentally changing, as we've seen market dynamics uh, affect both the, the shipping, uh, the contract sizes, and more importantly, the number of countries that we're starting to deal with and their financing. Of course, increased supply, as it normally does, has an impact on prices, and producers, of course, are never thrilled by lower prices. But the good news is that availability and affordability of gas also it provides an opportunity to uh, fuel further growth in demand by looking for new markets, uh, looking for markets that now have an affordable price point uh, to, uh, to use the fuel that we believe should be the fuel of choice. It's a world that clearly has a desire for more gas in its energy mix. We've heard a little bit about PM 2.5 and NOx and SOx particularly as countries strive to reduce emissions, not just for the obvious things that we talk about, which is pollution, but more importantly, the health of their citizens uh, and the affordability of energy uh, in their energy mix. We need to think about, though, the broader global energy mix and, and, and acknowledge that a change is underway with the rise of renewables, opening up both the challenges and opportunity. And of course, the economic rationalists amongst us in the room will like, always like to say that uh, it's difficult to see how renewables come into the marketplace. But as we know, those who have not, those countries that are not rich in resources and those who are users of it, for, of energy, for whatever reason, whether it be for geopolitical reasons, whether it be for other social reasons, uh, are often motivated to make investments or incentivize investments uh, that don't often uh, make uh, the uh, the grade when it comes to investment return, but it's a social investment return. So it goes way beyond uh, the normal economics that we might look at as we look at our investments. What I'll talk about shortly is some of the strategies that we can deploy in response to these shifts in supply and demand. And a lot of it's being driven on the demand side at the moment. So we've had a, a long period where the supply side dominated the market. And I must say it was, it was pretty easy uh, in many respects because as a supplier, uh, we had the, the uh, market knocking on our door looking for supply. This has now fundamentally changed. We've got a new world in which we need to operate. I do think it's important that we have an honest debate about the strengths and weaknesses of energy sources. And it's fair to say that coal will remain a very important fuel in the energy mix, but its in exponential growth is slowing. And it's really, it, and it's unlikely to be a growing part of the market in the future, but it will certainly maintain a significant place. Renewables, as we know, are starting from a very low base, but they're making inroads into energy markets, particularly for power generation, and we can't afford to ignore that. And I must say, they're making tremendous inroads into the minds of consumers, those people out there who are making choices each and every day, not necessarily governments. And remember, governments are often driven by consumer sentiment. Governments rarely lead when it comes to consumer sentiment. They often respond uh, to what their voters uh, uh, require. This competition, of course, has been building for some time. We've been watching it as an industry, but it's really only in recent years that governments have made some significant inroads and significant steps. Uh, in my home country, in Australia, we've actually seen a rapid growth in renewables in recent years, and so we're blessed uh, by having an endowment not only of natural resources, including hydrocarbons, but also uh, solar, and a lesser extent, hydro. Uh, and you've seen that debate at a state level occurring within Australia, and of course our federal system uh, doesn't allow federal control of our energy mix. So these are individual state decisions. And you would have seen in re recent time uh, the advent of renewables getting into the power sector in Australia uh, and causing significant disruption as people have forgotten uh, what baseload generation means in, in the interconnectivity of each of the systems to the point where we, we are on the cusp of being, becoming the largest LNG exporter in the world and yet there are conversations now about actually having a regas terminal installed on the east coast of Australia because we haven't got our power system right. This variability in renewables and the challenge that it brings was highlighted in a recent report by the Australian government's chief scientist, Alan Finkel. And Mr. Finkel, or Professor Finkel, recommended a new approach was needed to mitigate this variability. His proposed solution is the introduction of a generator reliability obligation 
that we require new generators to ensure that they can provide dispatchable power as required. And the Australian government has now learned that privatisation of industry uh, brings with it additional responsibilities of governance and so forth. Uh, and when you have foreign owners of critical infrastructure assets, they're often driven uh, by the needs of their own shareholders and governments uh, that are often uh, dislocated from the realities of what we're doing in Australia. Of course, these ideas from Professor Finkel also present an opportunity for gas-fired power to complement renewable generation. As we've heard earlier this morning, battery technology will continue to develop, but it has limitations. And the reality is that renewables will need to partner with another energy source. And of course, uh, gas is the prime energy source for that partnership. A rise of renewables and heightened climate concerns also underline how important it is for oil and gas to be part of this particular social debate, as uncomfortable as it may be for oil and gas producers from time to time. It's not an area that we've typically uh, enjoyed being in. But we need to be conscious of how our resources will be developed in a carbon-constrained world. It's one that we need to contribute to the, not only the social debate, but also the solution. Of course, for governments, the temptation is to impose carbon taxes. But we know that carbon taxes are just going to be a leakage out of the system unless they're garnered uh, and ensured that they'll go into supplying uh, in, and ensuring reliable power. So it's a com incumbent upon us to ensure, as an industry, to ensure that we are responsible not only in our operations, uh, but good stewards of the environment. It's a fair assumption that renewables will continue to be a growing part of the marketplace, but as we've already heard, uh, that marketplace will have uh, a need for hydrocarbons uh, in at least the foreseeable future. I've already mentioned some changes in market dynamics, and I really need to think about how this also changes in marketing of our product and for financing of future developments. So we've talked a lot about renewables and how that impacts us, uh, but we also need to think about how we actually build these new projects that are going to supply all, all of this wonderful uh, gas into the future. Of course, at a time of abundance, buyers take a much different approach. They just sit on the fence. Traditional LNG buyers are still relevant, but of course we're seeing new smaller buyers emerging. And those buyers, though, have a different makeup. They have different uh, credit abilities. They have different needs for contracts and so forth. And of course, the current availability of gas and the opening up of contracts has allowed a whole, a whole set of new buyers to come into the marketplace. And those buyers are telling us every day, particularly in developing countries, that gas is a fuel of choice for them. Imports to new countries, of course, have been facilitated by new business models and the advent of floating storage regasification units has been a game changer for the industry, uh, as we have already heard that shale gas has been a game changer in the US. Uh, FSRUs now account for about 30 million tonnes per annum of imports up from about 10 million tonnes in 2012, and that's just going to continue to grow. It's a business model that's flexible. We're seeing that fixed pipelines are now being replaced by virtual pipelines as the shipping industry is now reaching critical mass with the ability to transport fuels around the world and the changes in the destination and source clauses that existed in some of the original contracts. We're seeing many new countries come into, into the mix and I expect we're going to see many more over the next few years. We're also dealing with different customers, different types of relationships who have different expectations, different pricing points and different flexibilities. Many of our customers are sh seeking shorter, more flexible contracts and smaller parcel sizes. These are all contrary to the investment thesis for long cycle LNG projects. So we've got a new customer base coming into the marketplace. They want flexibility, shorter contracts, uh, different pricing points, and have sometimes sub-investment grade uh, ability to purchase in the market. And here on the supply side, we've got long cycle investments that have returns typically payback periods of 15 years or more uh, and very, very deep capital requirements up front. So how do you match the two of those together? Well. It means we as producers are going to have to put our thinking caps on and be more flexible in what we do 
uh, in our marketing and contracting. We need to help solve this problem or else this opportunity will pass because those customers require energy and if our energy is not available, they'll simply go somewhere else. As sellers, we need to also consider the flexibility we need to be successful in this particular marketplace. And it means we have to take a fundamentally different view to the way that we sell into the market and the way that we manage risk in our portfolios. Gone are the days of the big long-term pipeline contracts that were simply a cash register that ticked over with a CPI linkage and so forth. That risk, that risk profile has fundamentally changed for us and it's something that we're going to have to consider as we go into the industry. Let's also talk about transport. LNG historically has had a very small footprint in the transport industry. It's been mostly used for town gas and power generation. Uh, the future new markets could be in transport and you've heard a lot about the IMO regulation changes on shipping and the impact that they may have, that may have come 2020. I'm not sure what the penetration into shipping will be. Uh, I do know, as you've already heard, that there's basically zero knocks and socks uh, from gas. I do know uh, that there are ports and harbours in the world that are already taking it into their own hands to ensure rem emissions are reduced and LNG in particular has a place in that mix. Uh, and I do know that the potential market uh, in the global shipping industry is equivalent to the total LNG supply in the world today. So it doesn't take much math to say even a 10 or 20 percent market penetration is going to fundamentally change the dynamics uh, of the industry and is going to provide us a new source uh, for our markets. Alter alternatively, of course, as we know, LNG is not an end product. It's just simply a form in which uh, gas is transported. And of course, it can be moved into CNG, and the numbers are compelling. The bus fleet in China alone will equate to around about 20 million tonnes if China decided uh, tomorrow that it was going to convert all of its bus fleet uh, to compressed natural gas. And as we know, India is already moving down that path. So there are a number of positive signals on the future for us. Uh, we as a company are already moving forward uh, with what we call the Green Corridor. We're working with the major mining companies in Australia, uh, Rio Tinto, BHP and FNG, in creating a Green Corridor uh, up into China. And that's re really talking about the iron ore products that are moved out of the west of Australia and converting those ships, the cape size vessels, to LNG in the future. So you can see things are already starting to move in that, that part and the market itself is a very competitive one. Uh, in addition to, of course, seeking new markets, we're already also looking at new ways in which we can build uh, our facilities and leverage off existing infrastructure. So there's some fundamental changes of these, uh, these things happening on now. And of course, we've seen some announcement in recent times of new gas potentially coming into the marketplace uh, from 2025 onwards. And I would, rather than say that's a threat to the market, I would say it's a vote of confidence in the market uh, that people, very well informed countries, are making decisions about future investments uh, and can see a point in the marketplace and a signalling to the market that they will be there. So those who are making decisions about gas as their fuel of choice can be assured uh, that those countries that are the stewards of that resource endowment are going to make those investments that are required uh, to ensure that they have an adequate and secure supply of energy for many, many years into the future. I'm going to talk about a few uh, other things as we go through Q&A today. So I won't, I won't dwell uh, very much on what's required to actually supply gas into the marketplace, notwithstanding it says any, any uh, consensus on supply-demand curves will tell you that we must have project investments being approved in the order of 20 million tonnes per annum uh, each year from this year. Uh, this year we expect it'll be maybe zero uh, to five, so we're already behind. A 20 million tonne per annum uh, investment, depending on where it is in the world, uh, can be anywhere between 30 to, 30 to 50 billion US dollars. So you can see these are significant investments and we're already getting behind the curve. So it's incumbent, I think, on buyers to come back into the marketplace and help us. Today, I've talked about four strategies for the new reality. Firstly, we need to acknowledge the rise of renewables. 
It, we just need to accept it rather than deny it. Uh, the pace of change uh, we can argue over and debate. Uh, there are, of course, limitations, but those limitations will be overcome. Uh, humans have done that consistently over time. So things we see as limitations today, uh, tomorrow will be opportunities for someone and someone will go and crack that code. As you know, any time there's an incentive, uh, particularly a financial incentive to, to solve a problem, uh, there are a lot of people who put a lot of time and energy into solving that and eventually it will be solved. Uh, so renewables will play a significant role into the future and we need to think about how we play with that. Secondly, we need to be more sophisticated and flexible in our contracting and marketing to deal with the more fluid marketplace that's in front of us. We need to also, thirdly, we need to appeal to new customers for the conventional uses of our product and proactively market new uses. Fourthly, we need to think about how we finance projects, focusing on developments that have a faster time to market. Uh, because we're fast getting to a point where only the very biggest of the companies can finance <coughs> projects. And of course, that's not a good thing going into the future to ensure we have supply. Fifth and finally, I'd really like to mention the interwoven elements of technology and the things that on the first four strategies that I talked about are, are fundamental things that we'll need to consider uh, as we go forward. And of course, I'm not talking about improvements in equipment, and I'm sure the equipment manufacturers in the room would like to tell me that they've got model uh, 73 underway, and of course, it's cheaper than model 72. It'll go faster, and it's got, uh, and I'll like the color of it, and so forth. Uh, but it's really not technology breakthroughs we're talking about in the conventional sense of the oil and gas industry. It's contemporary technology, contemporary business breakthroughs, uh, and of course, that's in data science, uh, artificial intelligence or cognitive computing. Uh, it's in additive manufacturing or 3D printing. And of course, it's in robotics. And it's being able to pull all of those together and really uh, thrive, not just survive in a contemporary world using contemporary business models uh, that will challenge the oil and gas industry uh, based on the cycle time of change. And of course, those things are the things I think will start to differentiate companies as we move into the future. Finally, I'd also like to reflect on what's not changed in the so-called new reality. Global energy demand is still growing. That hasn't changed. Demographic drivers will remain the most important driver of energy demand. Uh, that hasn't changed at all. And global population is continuing to grow. Uh, that hasn't changed at all. The mix may change where that population is growing and so forth may change. But the reality is that inexorable link between energy demand and population growth remains and will be there in the future. In all foreseeable futures, uh, we, can, we can actually see that gas will continue to have a significant role in meeting the world energy demand. I think the challenge for us as we go forward is what does that future look like? How do we manage those uncertainties? Now, and importantly, how do we give the surety to our buyers, the people making those long-term 40-year decisions uh, on their investments, that the product that we supply will be both reliable and affordable uh, as we go forward. So with that, I thank you uh, for your attention this morning. And thank you, Dr. Coleman, for uh, a wonderful talk. And uh, incidentally, both the speakers today, I mean, they um, spoke in uh, favor of uh, LNG as a future strategy. So um, uh, we have uh, around 10 to 15 minutes time for Q&A. But uh, before, before I open the floor for the question and answers, uh, my, my, uh, the LNG user is a simple question for uh, the two speakers. Mm, traditionally, we had been linking the LNG price with uh, some crude price. I mean, do you see any change uh, in pricing mechanism? especially for a consumer, and the other costs are also significant. I mean, when we talk about the liquefaction cost or uh, regasification cost, transportation cost, and the LNG cost itself, the base price is less, then other costs become very, very significant. So do you, do you see market moving uh, to any other concept? I'm asking both of you. <laughs> Let me, let me start on that. I, I, 
I do see a change uh, in the pricing points and uh, the linkages. So, and you could probably uh, see a transition coming. The question is, it's not if in my mind, it's just simply when uh, and how that, that pricing point changes. And of course, there's been an historical linkage to, to uh, an oil price index uh, and of course a slope and a constant on that that generally reflects shipping costs and so forth. Uh, I think more and more as sellers were going to the buyers and saying, what, what do you really need as a buyer to manage your business so your business can be sustainable into the future? I think as, as sellers we're becoming more sophisticated in understanding the buyer's needs and the buyer's business model. Uh, as you just heard uh, in my presentation though, the, the number of buyers we do, are dealing with now uh, has grown exponentially. Uh, and so there's a challenge for us now. Uh, we used to have a set of buyers we understood very well. Uh, they were regulated utilities and your regulated utilities have tariff review structures and so forth uh, and are generally backed by government. And so the business model for investment was a fairly straightforward one and we could, we could manage that. Today's buyers require a lot, a lot more flexibility, uh, shorter contract terms, different volume quantities. Uh, they want uh, the ability to resell and compete with a product in the marketplace and so forth. So it's a completely different world. So that just says, look, the price point is going to change. Um, I, I often challenge my marketing team. Of course, I like to quote Henry Ford uh, when he first built the Model T. And, and, and of course, Henry Ford is quoted as saying, uh, you can have any color you want as long as it's black. Um, I, I kind of think our our marketing models have been that way over the years as we've approached buyers. You can have any colour you want as long as it's oil price linked. Uh, so we're going to have to change. But I think that change will then come back to our ability to, to invest. Uh, and so we'll have to look at it and say, yes, we can sell some gas maybe on a fixed price with a some sort of commodity price escalator or CPI escalator on it. Uh, but that's probably for a shorter period of time. I, I can't see a future at the moment where a major project will be underpinned by that sort of uh, price structure. But I think you'll see layering, more sophistication uh, in those models. And to be honest, there'll be some buyers who are quite happy to maintain oil linkage. Uh, you know, it's not so long ago that I couldn't have a uh, discussion with buyers out of parts of Asia and it had to have a Henry Hub conversation. Today, they don't want to talk to me about Henry Hub uh, at all. So you can see even the buyers are moving in the way that they think about uh, pricing point mix and their own flexibility in their own portfolio. And I think they're starting to realise um, what I told them three years ago, if you want Henry Hub, go buy Henry Hub. Don't try and force it into a contract from a different source point because it doesn't reflect the cost of supply. So I think it's a far more um, sophisticated and mature conversation that we're having these days and I think you're going to see companies uh, depending on the on the risk of their projects and so forth take a more pragmatic approach okay. well actually um, I think that there is going to be some uh, kind of uh, evolution in the in the prices of course the price of gas is already very low because of the uh, oil price but I think that uh, uh, there would be some uh, elements of the pricing mechanism uh, um, going to be there at least for the pipeline trade. You know, because there is a fundamental difference between the LNG and pipeline trade. And all of these uh, new uh, mechanisms that are now being uh, discussed is because of the increase in the LNG trade. And uh, it is not because of the uh, pipeline trade. In the pipeline trade, you have one supplier and one uh, buyer, so uh, it's, uh, the mechanism is, is much more uh, simple. But as uh, the trade of LNG is growing, uh, and as uh, uh, Peter said, uh, the number of buyers would increase, and also the number of suppliers are increasing, so there would be more kind of flexibility. Uh, but, uh, you know, on the pricing mechanism, there is one fundamental principle that is oil linked. The oil link, uh, uh, the people used to think that oil link prices is higher prices. But actually, in the past uh, few years, it proved that this is not the case. I mean, sometimes the spot price is uh, higher than the oil link prices. So the oil link price provides a kind of stability 
to the, uh, to the buyer and supplier. And uh, in the trade of gas, what is uh, uh, very fundamental and is very important is to establish a long-term partnership. This is very important. For, a, for example, a power plant uh, buyer, they need a very smooth, stable flow of energy. And for this, they have to have a long-term contract based on a very trustable, reliable mechanism that they can predict the future. Otherwise, they would not be able to finance it. They would not be able to, uh, to do their, their uh, normal work. So this is why uh, I think that now we are in a, in a situation where nobody knows which direction they should go. The, there are some hops, as mentioned, Henry Hobbs. Henry Hobbs does not have to do anything with the, with the international pricing of the gas. It is a domestic uh, hub of the United States, and the domestic price of the United States cannot have any kind of link, a business link, for the buyers in India, or buyers in China, or in, in, in Asia. So uh, this is why, I mean, the creation of hubs. We have Singapore, we have Japan, we have China, there are lots of uh, others that are in the process of creation hubs. So hub pricing, spot pricing, oil linkage, all are now in discussion. And I think that what prevails in the gas is a mechanism which could give guarantee to the buyer and supplier a long-term partnership and, and long-term kind of uh, relationship. For the sellers, for example, I mean, and the companies, they have to finance, I mean, uh, they have to uh, invest so this is why any kind of mechanism and pricing that could support the eventual investment would be, of course, desirable. So, so this is why between all of these controversies, I guess that we would be landing in a, in a kind of mechanism which is not going to be very uh, fluid. I mean, because gas, even the LNG, needs some sort of long-term relationship. For a timing right now, in Japan, more than 85% of the, of the contracts are long-term and based on the oil link. So uh, this is why it's not, I mean, not, uh, all of these uh, new mechanisms are just uh, constituting a part of the, very small part of the uh, gas trade, something around maybe 20% of it, not more than that. So we are in the evolutionary process, I guess. Thank you. I think we can take a couple of questions from the floor. Lynn Anderson, uh, uh, freelance journalist, United States of America. What will be the price of natural gas in 12 months? Your best guess. I think only yes. astrologists can answer. What will the gas price? Uh, the, the gas price in North America or the gas price globally? Uh, on uh, long-term global? Uh, probably around the same price it is, is today. There's, there's, not, uh, there's some new supply coming into the marketplace over the next 12 months. That Some of that supply has a home at the moment, but what you'll see is probably more volume coming into the spot market. There'll be more seasonality uh, or variability based on seasonal demand over the next couple of years as that spot supply tries to to find a home, and I, and I would suggest uh, you'll see an advent of trading platforms starting to occur, uh, like you have in crude oil at the moment, as you're probably aware. Uh, spot trades in LNG are still done between traders, typically done between um, telephone conversations and emails. I think you'll see more transparent trading platforms uh, start to emerge, and people will be able to openly bid uh, for spot supplies, but that's more that will come into the marketplace as more liquidity comes in. But with respect to the actual supply um, demand dynamics, um, there's a lot of gas doesn't have a home yet. Uh, it, it is getting soaked up by the market. It was soaked up in 2016, the first half of 2017. So we haven't seen a cratering of price that people expected. Uh, and in my view, it's due to the fact that, uh, as we mentioned, a lot of market players are now seeing this new business model with uh, floating uh, regasification units, 
uh, as, as a way of getting energy into energy starved markets and also getting different pricing points. So uh, what you're actually seeing is gas on gas competition also being created in markets that have existing gas supply uh, as they try and drive down pipeline gas. Uh, by bringing more ga uh, gas on gas competition and then also as countries try and break monopoly um, situations where you've had a major national gas company or so forth purchasing gas for a long period of time and they're allowing uh, other players now to come into the market uh, in a structured way. So there's a lot of not just uh, market reform going on with on the supply side and but also uh, the revenue streams for many of our bu buyers or customers are changing. The certainty of those revenue streams are changing as their host governments are, are starting to break down uh, some of the uh, monopolies that they had and open up uh, more competition there. So uh, my, my short answer is I, I think you'll see more uh, variability in the spot market. The long-term market uh, will be linked to oil price and so that won't change fundamentally. Uh, and you'll probably see uh, new players coming into the market as they take the opportunity for low prices to lock that in. It, it's a really good time to buy. Uh, so if there's any buyers in the market, uh, if you can re really see your way past and sign up to a 10-year contract today, it, it's a really good time to buy uh, in the marketplace. And you're seeing um, some parties do that uh, now as they start to uh, restructure their own energy market. Uh, do, do you see the um, LNG, LNG process ships which are coming out like Shell and Petronas as a game changer to the industry because obviously they're not going to need the big onshore process facilities and obviously this is going to have a big thing to sit on the wells and as you go from there, where do you think that's going to lead going forward? Uh, look, uh, the, you're talking about floating FLNG units. I, I think they'll have a, a place in the marketplace. Uh, it'll be just how quickly that they take take that place. They're very well suited for remote uh, operations uh, where you can avoid having to establish all of the uh, infrastructure that's required. Um, they're well suited for a certain size of, of resource. Uh, their limitations are they're not readily expandable, so you don't get the benefits of a brownfield expansion that you do with an onshore facility, but they're, they're, they're trade-offs. My, my view is I, I, I think I simply look at the oil uh, processing vessels, the FPSOs, think about where they started, uh, think about how long it took for them. And I, I think FLNG units have similar potential but probably won't move forward as rapidly because of the complexity of the processing uh, and the capital intensiveness of it. There's a, there's a big difference between uh, an FLNG vessel and its complexity and a, an equivalent oil vessel. So I think there'll be some limitations there on technology and barriers to entry. But, but they are just another uh, tool uh, in the toolbox, so to speak, for resource companies to be able to unlock what would otherwise be stranded resources. Okay, thank you very much for excellent uh, speeches. And uh, just now, the uh, Dr. Adeli uh, mentioned that the uh, uh, Japan 85% of this the, uh, sh the long term the contract. And uh, as we know that the oil prices uh, collapsed uh, uh, about three years. So these long term contracts link with the oil prices, and then a very special phenomena happens. That is the spot price, even cheaper than the long-term contract. So uh, as you mentioned that, the uh, evolution happens and for the contract me mechanism and also different hubs in the United States, St. Henry Hub, MPB price in Europe, and the, G uh, uh, NBC, uh, the uh, GCC price in, in Asia. So by this situation, maybe you can share this or maybe uh, Peter can share with it all together. And how is these negotiations? between these buyers. And because of the oil price are designed, maybe 10 years before, uh, is the oil price is around $100. Now it's about 47, you know, so they lose a lot of money. And it, so that's the happens another, that is the uh, short term, uh, more and more. And so however, for the uh, 
interest of both the producer and consumers, maybe the long term for some of the big product better, and also encouragement for the investment of these producers. So what is the, the recent progress for these kind of the discussions? Thank you. Well, uh, actually, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the price for the time being, the price of gas is at its floor. And uh, because of the fall in the price of oil, in the past three years, the price of gas has fallen down. And uh, as uh, Peter mentioned, that uh, this is going to continue at least for the, for the next uh, few years until at least 2020 or 2022, as uh, there are uh, much more supply. And uh, so whether it is oil linked or a spot, I mean, this price is the floor price. It is around this. The, the uh, difference is not that much. But uh, uh, now it is very much beneficial for the buyers to have a long-term contract at this price, because the long-term contract, even oil-linked, is going to be more beneficial for them. They benefit from this. Uh, therefore, they don't need even to go to the, to the uh, spot pricing. I mean, spot pricing is uh, just for complementary, uh, you know, um, requirement of the, of the power plants. It, it, it cannot really uh, make them uh, rely on the smooth flow of the energy for their uh, consumption. So this is why I guess that uh, the oil linked and also long term uh, contract will continue to go. This is not for the short term. This is going to be for the long term because as I said, the uh, gas uh, buyer and seller, they should have a very long term partnership and, and relationship. So this is going to continue. Uh, although there would be some hubs emerging, but even, uh, uh, the, even if, if they linked it to the, uh, to the hubs, they would prefer to have a long-term contract. The long-term contract does not have anything to do with the pricing mechanism. So that is going to continue. In my, uh, I, I believe that the long-term contract in Japan, elsewhere, is going to continue, but the pricing, the link of the price is going to change a bit. It would be hybrid, oil plus oil products, oil plus hops or something else. This is going to be an evolution. But the long term, I think that this is going to continue. Let, let, let me add to that. Um, as an old saying, Peter, we are short of time. Yeah, just, just quickly, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, let's not get caught up. Oil link contracts have been around forever, as you know. What's changing is the slope and the constant. So all we're moving is from a point in time where uh, sellers dominated the market and they wanted the slope to be as high as it could be so it was linked as closely to oil. Historically though, the constant's been large, particularly for utilities, and it's been a much lower slope. Uh, and we're moving back to more of the traditional contracts again. So there'll be a, a price linkage with some commodity that's readily tradable that people understand but there's more of a bias these days to a constant. Uh, and that also helps sellers, to be honest, because at least we know what the price point's going to be. Thanks a lot. Uh, I, I think that though, the, though the topic is extremely interesting and uh, there would be a lot of questions, but uh, we have already overshot our time by nearly seven minutes. If uh, there are a couple of uh, questions, I'm sure that uh, you can interact independently, individually with the speakers. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Adili and uh, Mr. Coleman. Thank you. Thank you.